you'll see that I have all my contact info here, uh, kcleinatcentury1.com, as well as Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, all of those social media platforms. I'm K.E. Klein. So uh, I'd love it if you connected with me there. And, um, you know, if you have any questions or anything like that you'd like to follow up with afterwards, then we'll make sure that that happens. You know, I'll get you the slides and the scripts or any of those sort of things if, if that's of interest to you. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, Mark and I uh, were chatting a little bit uh, a couple months ago when, when he was putting me on the calendar. And he said, you know, um, let's talk about uh, something that's kind of intermediate level that could appeal to a lot of folks, but may have some information that is not um, widely known. You know, something that could appeal to everyone, stuff that's good for beginners through top level pros. And so uh, this is a great session for that because I have um, a lot of stuff that, you know, some folks don't know in here, even if they've been doing SQL Server for many years. Uh, the intention is to cover not just uh, queries, but also a little bit of everything, a little bit about database design, configuration settings on your SQL Server, and a whole variety of things like that. Okay. So uh, if you'll bear with me for just a minute, my uh, employer, Century One, uh, always likes for me to put in a plug for them. So, just to tell you a little bit about Century One, um, we are known in the industry as being the the best in the business. We uh, are the premium brand. So, the products that we make for optimization, monitoring, and alerting, as well as tuning on SQL Server, are top of the line. Uh, they don't cost really anything extra than uh, than the competitors in the market, but we give you more information, more data points uh, at a higher polling frequency with greater granularity over a longer period of time with lower overhead. Um, unlike everybody else in the market, we are super passionate about SQL Server. So you'll see we have a lot of MVPs on staff. And so that really shows up in the way we create our products for you. Um, so you have unprecedented amount of information compared to anyone else out there. The thing though that I'm really proud about is I had been a DBA for many years and uh, there weren't tools back then. Uh, in fact, um, I actually worked on one of the, uh, I, I left the, the big enterprise that I worked at as a DBA and led the data management team. And I went to work for one of the first companies that made tools for DBAs uh, on a product called Toad. So if you're an Oracle person, I'm, I'm sure that rings a bell for you. And so as time went on, came to work here at Century One. And the reason for that is we love our customers. And I was a former DBA and had dealt with companies that sold us tools that, did, you know, you could tell that um, support wasn't their thing. I mean, they offered it to you because that's an expectation. But at Century One, if you look at any of the metrics by which a customer is supported by a vendor, we're in the top 1%, not just for monitoring companies, but for the entire software industry. Um, and so this means a lot to me that people love our company for no other reason than the fact that we strive day in and day out to really take good care of you. And that's a good deal. So uh, what kind of products do we have? Well, um, one such product is a very well-known product called uh, Plan Explorer. And this is a completely free product. Uh, I'll give you just a, a, a two second view of it later on as part of the demo uh, for some of the code that we're looking at. And what it does is it makes uh, tuning queries and reading their execution plans much, much easier than what you could do with Management Studio or Azure Data Studio. Um, and it's so free, we don't even ask for an email address when you download it. So it's just kind of a service that we give to the, uh, to the, to the market. Um, our other two leading products are Century One Document, which is a data, um, kind of a, a metadata product. It tells you all about your data dictionary. It builds out all kinds of information about what is in your enterprise supporting your database systems. And it will also do impact analysis and uh, data lineage. So if you have a multi-part system that, you know, you've got a Oracle source system and it uses ETL processes to move data to a staging server, and then the data gets munged and transformed there and it goes to a SQL server production server, 
And then after a while it goes to a data warehouse and then from there, there's Tableau and Power BI and even some Excel reports built off of that. What our system does is it, it, it ena enables you uh, to be able to say something like, hey, we've got to change a bunch of these reports. If we actually need to make some of these, these fields bigger and have our users enter more information, you know, change the data type, how many systems is that going to impact? And so it can answer questions like that for you. Very powerful. Uh, the other one, of course, is SQL Sentry, which looks at your SQL server. And uh, we've changed the, the SKU a little bit. So now it also looks at everything in your Windows server and your virtual machine. So you can tell everything top to bottom that is happening on your SQL server um, through the hypervisor, through the guest, all the way to the bare metal. Very powerful product as well. Okay. Uh, also, just a quick note about Century One ourselves. Uh, the thing I want to point out on this particular slide is the website called SQLPerformance.com. And this is a fantastic blog, hundreds of thousands of page views every month. And it's all about improving the performance of SQL Server, mostly about T-SQL, but there's lots of stuff on server settings and all kinds of things related to making your SQL Server faster or your Azure SQL database. Um, CenturyOne.com slash resources has all of our eBooks and, and they're great, um, as well as white papers, case studies. And then one that's not on the list there is CenturyOne.com slash webinars. And this session that we're doing right now is actually uh, one that has been recorded and is available for you to view after the fact at uh, CenturyOne.com slash webinars and also the scripts and the PowerPoint slides are there as well, okay? All right, so I'm actually going to skip this uh, this particular slide because uh, you you know you don't care about this. I'll just be real quick. I started my career in '86 um, working for NASA and later as a civilian employee of the uh, U.S. Army Missile Command. Uh, in the late '90s, I was one of the original nine founders of PASS, and I was president from 2004 to 2008. And I've written a ton of books. Uh, my most popular one is Sequel in a Nutshell, a bestseller. And we're going to have a new edition of that out early next year. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so what are we going to talk about today on this particular discussion of architecture? Well, one of the problems with using the term architecture is whose architecture are you talking about, right? So there's infrastructure architecture and how you design servers and subnets and all that. And there's network architecture. There's also data architecture, right? So how do we design our databases? How do we choose data types? Those kinds of issues. And then we have application architecture. And this is about how do we do uh, the front end stuff? How do we interrogate the database on the back end? And so rather than try and exclude a bunch of stuff, this particular session actually goes ahead and covers all of it, right? So we're gonna talk about a few things in each of these. So let's get started. When talking about a SQL server, something that uh, used to be crucially important, uh, now that we have things like um, flash storage arrays and NVMe and those high speed kind of storage way arrays, it's a little less, little less significant. But um, I find that anybody who's using the older versions of SQL Server, older versions of Windows on their own on-premises SQL servers are gonna have issues, particularly if you're using 2014, SQL Server 2014 and prior, and you're using a comparable release of Windows and prior. So in those versions, one of the things that we find is that um, uh, th they do not by default use multiple data files for the database. Um, and there's no kind of emphasis on segregation of your file system. So architecturally speaking, one of the best things you could do back in the old days was to make sure that your database, you know, let's say you have a sales database, you might have one data file for all of the sales information and one transaction log file for all of the information on that SQL Server database. And the most elementary thing you could do in the days of hard disks was to make sure that those were on separate hard disks or hard disk arrays. And the reason for that, simply enough, is that data is a very randomized read-write pattern. 
And so that armature on those hard disks would be moving back and forth beep, 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 all the time on the different um, files on the disk. But the transaction log, on the other hand, was serial in nature, or is serial in nature. Today it is as well. So it writes one entry after another, okay? And if you have hard disks with armatures, the fact that you have to answer all these randomized reads and writes for the data, and then come back and write serially on the log, spelled trouble if you put them onto the same disk. And so if you just separated those onto different disks or different uh, rate arrays, you know, drive F and drive M or something like that, you'd get a 30% performance in your OLTP throughput, okay? Now, as time went on, one of the things we realized is that there's a very different nature in the way our workloads access data. And so as we began to very strongly differentiate an OLTP workload, a transaction driven workload that has very small singleton inserts, updates, deletes, and slightly larger kind of select statements, that's a very different workload than a business intelligence reporting and analysis workload in which we're actually doing, seldom doing singleton inserts, maybe never, maybe we're just doing bulk loads every night. And we're doing very large aggregated reads to build out reports in our data warehouse. So one of the next things we learned to do back in the mid 80, uh, mid 90s rather, is whenever you can build a system, an architecture in which those reporting systems have their own sets of drives. Maybe even if you can have a secondary server so that it is the read oriented server and it has its own indexes and things like that. It's own separated buffers so that the data cache and the plan cache are separated from the entire instance of SQL Server for the OLTP side. So that was another major breakthrough in performance. You take that down uh, even a level deeper and what we're finding is that there's also a difference between reporting and data systems in terms of not just uh, well, the tables are going to probably be the same, but the amount of data that you have in those tables could be vastly different because you might not need more than the past three months of data for the OLTP system, but you need the past three years of data for the BI system. So that's one big difference you might find. And then the, the next would be that um, adding lots and lots of indexes to an OLTP system can actually be very costly in terms of performance. Um, indexes only speed up read operations. Um, and so if you have lots and lots of additional indexes on a very heavy write oriented workload, it probably won't help and it may even hurt. Conversely, if you have that reporting server and you have lots of stuff on there, um, index all you want because that's probably gonna help all of those different reports and, and things like that. So one of the first things that you learn when we're talking about server level construction of your SQL servers is to segregate those workloads, both uh, workload level and at the file level, okay? Um, and there's even more stuff you can do as well. Uh, and I have a full day session and a half day session that even goes into tuning your memory and different things like that. But this is a fundamental that everybody should know about uh, segregating out your different uh, types of workload. Um, if you have some questions maybe about, you know, how is this impacted by having SSDs or, you know, flash arrays and so forth, let's hold those for a little bit and we'll get to those, um, those kind of questions later. So, we just talked about the high level goings on with the server. Let's take it down a level and, and look at those various tables and indexes that we were talking about. And what we have on um, a SQL server, and this is actually also true for Sybase, which is now called SAP, HANA, um, and SAP Adaptive Server. We've got three kinds of structures that manage data. We have a table that has no clustered index. That's called a heap uh, because it has no organization. It's like take, uh, um, if you imagine a, a jug full of sand and each grain of sand is a, is a data, uh, a point of data and you poured it out, it just pour out in a heap. There's no organization to it. However, tables with a clustered index 
organize the data according to the clustered index and provides it a physical order that the data is written to disk. And then finally, there's another structure called a non-clustered index, which is like you would find at the back of a book that helps you find topically uh, where your different uh, data is and gets you to it very quickly. We also use the term for non-clustered indexes as a search argument because you're probably going to want to have an, a non-clustered index on columns that you uh, use to filter your data uh, with where clauses or join clauses. So those are search arguments. So SQL Server typically organizes the data in 8K data pages. And each data page has a little bit of header space. And it also has a little bit of footer space for the uh, what's called the slot array at the, at the end of it. And uh, the page header has lots of little interesting bits and bytes in it that help SQL Ser Server figure out things very quickly. For example, if you've ever run what's called a um, differential backup, okay, um, it goes very quickly and somehow Automagically, SQL Server is able to find every page in the database that has changed since the last time you ran a full backup. Well, actually, the way it does that is there's a little bit in the header of each page that says, I have been changed since the last backup. It's either zero, meaning I haven't changed, or it's one, meaning I have changed since the last backup. And so SQL Server is able to look at all the pages in the database and very quickly, blistering speed, run through that and back up just those pages that have changed. Uh, conversely, when a, a full backup goes through, it resets all of those values back to zero, okay? So we've got this page, and as we begin to add data to it, um, we maybe we have a clustered index. So we've got um, the number one to indicate the first value of uh, records in the table, and so that's Cooper. Somebody else comes along and inserts another record, and that's Hofstetter, number two. Somebody else enters Kuthrapali, right? And then somebody else enters uh, Wallowitz, but notice this one, for whatever reason, has the number five. Maybe someone else started a transaction before us and kind of grabbed the number four in memory and is holding that in memory with something called a latch, not a lock. It's a, it's a very transient memory. Um, holder, placeholder, if you will. And so they've got number four position, hasn't been entered in, into the table yet. And then the slot array, as you'll notice, when someone else finishes that transaction and their entry is written, Kripke, now the slot array changes to make sure that logically everything is in the proper order. And if we actually fill up the page, SQL Server will split the page and start adding new data to that new page. Again, another way to look at this as well for other kinds of structures inside of the database is when we have a heap, it's just a disorganized uh, group of these non-clustered uh, non index pages, right? Uh, so they don't have any kind of index, it's just data. And every so often we have what's called an IAM, an index allocation map. And so SQL Server places those a certain number of times every so often in the data file so it can find its way through very, very quickly. But this has some really big problems. Like what if I only want, I wanna find one specific page in this, like I wanna, uh, I want to find all the employees that start with K. And I know there's Kripke, Kripke and Kuthrapali, but because I don't have a doubly linked list in here to find my way forward and backward through the, the heap, I have to do a table scan every time I look at this table. Right? I have to read every single leaf page. On the other hand, if I've created a clustered index, what happens is SQL Server organizes all of the records on the pages so that they uh, go in the sort order you have specified in the clustered index. It also builds a doubly linked list so that if I need to find K, now all the employees starting with K, uh, they are in order. So I could start uh, and go in ascending order, or I could go in descending order, and it wouldn't take a lot of work for SQL Server to do that, unlike a heap. And then in addition to that, it builds on top of it something called a B-tree index, 
which a lot of people say is a binary tree. No, it's not. It's a balanced tree index. And so what happens in this case, if we're looking for people with the last name of K, what, um, what SQL Server will do is it'll say, okay, are the Ks to the left or the right? And it'll say, well, there's 12,000 rows in this table and 11,000 of the rows leading up to K go to the left, but everything from L onward go to the right. So it's balancing out which direction you go to the next lower level, deeper level of the index. So then it comes over and says, okay, um, now I'm on another intermediate level of the index. Which way do I go to find the Ks? And so finally you get to that deeper um, bottom level index and read only the pages you need. So you read one, two, three pages in this case, instead of every single page in that heap. So it greatly speeds up um, your SQL Server. Now, on top of that, we can add additional non-clustered indexes. And if you were to use one of the kind of um, kind of hex readers that you might have access to, or there's even some uh, un, uh, less documented DBCC commands about how to read um, the hexadecimal for these different objects. If we looked at a non-clustered index uh, as it's stored into the, uh, the data cache or even as it resides on disk, it's basically a table. It's just that the values point to the, the deeper level uh, other parts of the index. So what we have in a non-clustered index is we have the pointer, kind of a, a numeric or kind of a, a key, if you will, um, of what you have indexed. Um, and you also have the clustered index key. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment. So let's say we decided to put an index on last name, comma, first name in this employee table. What we would see if we looked at that under the microscope is we would see last name, comma, first name, and the clustered index key, which you know might be something like an employee ID. So what's cool about that is you can get a very powerful acceleration in certain kinds of queries by using what's called a covering index. Uh, what that term means is the index covered your question. And so if we wanted to say, Tell me all the names sorted by last name, comma, first name in the employee database. It could read all of that information. You know, that's all your query was, last name, comma, first name from employee table. It could read all that information by looking at the non-clustered index. And it doesn't even have to go to the actual table data itself to get that information. And this can be a huge acceleration. Uh, of your, you know, a request to your query. Again, they've got double link lists just as before so that it can search its way through downward and upward through the index and go just to the pages that it needs. So if it's a very heavy workload and is having to read every page and you were looking at an execution plan, you would see a scan. Whereas if it's using a non-clustered index, or even the clustered index, and it's able to go just to the two or three or 20 or 100 pages that it needs, you would see it use the word seek, which typically, not always, but typically provides better performance. Okay? And as I mentioned, they point, the non-clustered index points to the specific leaf pages to get the data you want. Okay? So, uh, you can also put a non-clustered index on a heap. It's just that... Um, the heap itself has less organization. So the, the non-clustered index helps, but it doesn't help quite as much as it could if you had put a clustered index on it, okay? So another interesting thing to think about here is how many round trips does SQL Server have to make to the data to answer your question? And this is intimately related to the way you've structured the indexes and the table. So as I mentioned before, uh, if you're able to use a clustering index, I'm sorry, a covering index, then that can help a lot because um, if the data isn't already in the cache, SQL Server has to go and get the data from the database file system, load it up into cache, and then answer your query and return the results to you. So there's times when you're like, you know what? Um, 
all of these pages are only half full because of so many page splits and fragmentations happening in over time. So that means if the pages are half full, the AK pages are half full, that means it has to do twice as much work loading up twice as many half empty pages to get the work done. So what you want to do if you have a, a read heavy performance workload where you're reading data a lot, you want those pages to be as full as they can be. Um, now in my OLTP systems, I would typically actually set uh, one of the how full is this table, uh, each of these pages gonna be uh, according to the, uh, um, the last time the index was rebuilt. How full is it gonna be? Um, maybe 80% full, 90% full? because I don't want it to cause those page splits, right? Uh, but on the other hand, if it's not an OLTP application, it's a read heavy application, I'll probably set that to 100%. I want that page to be 100% full. And um, so uh, there are some other things to keep in mind that can really impact how effective your SQL Server is able to fill up those pages. The first one on the list that I have there is using max data types. So if you use in varchar or varchar max, if you use var binary max, anything that has max, SQL Server throws away a lot of the rules that it has for how it handles data in tables and kind of messes you up, right? It makes keeping those pages full really hard. Um, there's lots of other things too, like maybe uh, you have a application that has a really huge text field and lets the end user put in a long list of things, you know, an array style. And so you have to parse and shred that and bring it back out anytime you want to access that data. Well, that's a situation where you probably want to normalize that a little bit further so that everything that goes into that text field actually goes into another... Hmm? Somebody joined us <laughs> with their audio on. So um, having said that, uh, let's move on. This is uh, one of the really, really important lessons I wanna convey to you. And I'll, I'll show you in some scripts in just a moment. Don't use GUIDs as your clustered key, okay? Um, instead, what you want is something narrow, something that doesn't change much. That's what I mean by static, something unique, um, and that would be typically a, a big int field and you monotonically increase the ID as you go along. If you need more numbers, don't forget that all the integer data types, you can go into the negatives as well. So that max number for a big int can also go, you know, twice as far because you can start at a negative number and work your way up into the positives. So think about uh, when I was talking about how full a page can be. Um, the a GUID is a very kind of thick data type. It is, uh, it's fat. It takes 16 bytes, if I recall, whereas a big int is only eight and a regular int is only four bytes. So you can save a ton of space not using GUIDs. That alone is a big deal, right? You can save a ton of space. And don't forget, every non-clustered index you have also keeps a copy per row of your clustered index key. So that means you're gonna have a GUID appearing in, you know, if you have a table with one clustered index, that's a GUID, and five non-clustered indexes, it means your GUID is gonna appear in, what, six, seven places? So enormous amount of bloat if you have millions of, or billions of rows in that table. The other thing too is that um, GUIDs are not sequential, of course, a global unique identifier. So that means as you're inserting things, you're gonna be causing page, page splits everywhere, which lead to massive amounts of fragmentation. And you're also gonna be, um, you're also gonna be unable to have a scan when it is the best answer to a, a query that you're writing. Like, tell me everybody who has made, excuse me, tell me everyone who has made quota uh, in the sales database uh, this quarter, if it was able to start at one person and just read person, 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 
It won't be able to do that with a GUID clustered key because they're unique and are not following on one another in a natural way. So it, it just automatically slows you down for those kind of read operations, okay? So read versus uh, full pages versus write performance is a little bit different. Whereas when you have reads, you wanted every one of those pages to be as close to full as you could reasonably get it. The flip side though, is if you have a OLTP workload with a heavy write profile, once each of these pages fills up as you go along, we've got an issue. If SQL Server says, you know what, I need to do an insert or an update, and I need to fit a record into the middle of a table that's already full, what I do is I do this page split operation. Uh, what I, I take half of the data from the page and I write it in the, uh, a new page. And then I have to verify it and I have to check all my foreign key relationships as I'm moving this around and I have to do the, I, uh, the IO level confirmations and so forth. You actually have about a 16 to one ratio in general per record uh, for the number of IOPS that happen to make this happen. But on top of that, SQL Server doesn't put it in the spot right adjacent to the record it, uh, from the page it came from. It puts it actually in the first open space it can find anywhere in the data file. So what that means for, is fragmentation. Just like in the old days, if you ever ran a disk defragmenter and you could see it moving um, parts of a, a, what I don't know, an image file so that they would all be contiguous. Well, we don't have that here when we have page splits. It just breaks it up and makes it discontiguous throughout. So uh, the typical solution would be to rebuild your indexes regularly. In my case, most of the time that meant on the weekends when there was a much smaller user um, users online. And then also to leave for those write heavy workloads, leave a little bit of the space free each time using that fill factor setting, okay? Now, Let's talk about the full pages and how they, uh, you know, impact performance. I'm just going to use an analogy here. You know, uh, let's say we're enthusiasts of uh, Downton Abbey, right? And, you know, they didn't have um, electrically driven uh, water systems. You had to actually uh, go to the well or some servant had to go to the well, you know, run the, the pail down to the water level, fill it up, pull it back up. And so let's say that's data. Every pail that's full is a page full of data. And so you, you, you tell one of your servants to you know, get the copper kettle, um, take that water, heat it up, pour it in the bath, and then go back, use the wooden pail in the, in the, um, in the well, fill that up and put it in the copper kettle again. And so if you have half empty pages or a third full pages, you're gonna have to do three times as many trips to fill up that bathtub. The bathtub being your query, right? To answer your query. Uh, conversely though, if you um, fill that all the way up, it takes less trips to the hard disk or to your SSD or wherever your database is sitting to load it up into RAM and to the data cache and then to provide it back to you as a result of your queries. So it's very important to kind of um, fit as much as you can in there for those read heavy applications. And then for the uh, write ha uh, heavy application, you want just a little bit open in case another something or other comes along. And uh, so it doesn't, you know, overfill it and cause you to have to get two buckets to make that work. Okay. So just a simple sort of analogy that hopefully makes that oh, you know sensible in your mind. Now here's a power move, and this is pretty cool. Um, we've done a lot of research on this where I work, and um, in talking to people over the years, uh, often suggested, hey, you know what? Why don't you enable database uh, data compression on your SQL Server database? And for a long time, up through SQL Server 2014. That was kind of a non-starter for a lot of people because it was only available in Enterprise Edition, okay, which is hella expensive. Um, however, in SQL Server Standard Edition, Service Pack 2, they made data compression available for everyone. 
And so I still encountered a lot of people like, yeah, I know it means a big savings in terms of uh, space on the SQL server, you know, it's like PKZIP or something like that. But I think the overhead for the IO, I'm sorry, for the CPU to compress that data down is gonna be too high. So we went and checked it out. And what we discovered, there are some caveats. There are a few edge cases where it, it's not quite as beneficial. But generally speaking, in, in a regular OLTP workload, it saves you 40, 40 um, percent space on disk and in memory, because the memory is um, very expensive and very precious. So it gives you more uh, space to play around with in memory. But it does that at a cost of, in terms of CPU overhead, 0.6%. Right, so not even one full percent. And basically in my book, that is free performance improvement. You haven't changed anything in your databases and your code and you're getting a 40% improvement in throughput. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, of course. Uh, for example, when you turn it on and it has to compress everything, it might take 10% CPU while it first does that. Um, also for um, backups and for things like index rebuilds and things, there's a little bit more overhead, but not a ton. So I encourage everyone to look at using data compression if you have SQL Server 2016 Service Pack 2 or later installed on your SQL servers, okay? Now, uh, another issue, a surprising issue for folks when you're designing your indexes is that um, concatenated indexes aren't always a good thing in terms of performance. I, I really love um, a concatenated index. What, uh, some people call those natural keys. Um, I really like those because they just make sense. So you read it and you say, oh, this is based on last name, first name, and the street that, uh, that the corporation is at. Okay, that makes sense. The problem is, again, going back uh, earlier, each of these is uh, stored in every row of the non-clustered index. So that means those pages get bloated out and repeated in multiple indexes. And then the other thing too, is that, um, and I'll show you here in, uh, in this page, SQL Server is only able to use a concatenated index working from the leftmost column towards the rightmost column in ordinal position. So if you had a query that said where last name equals a, the variable A, first name equals the variable B, and you know street equals variable C, works great. Very powerful search argument. Also works if you leave the trailing ones off in order. But what about this third example here? What if we started the where clause with last name equal, I'm sorry, first name equals a variable? Well, it turns out it can't use that index, okay? So it is better to use that surrogate key, which is an ID column basically, than it is to use a natural key if you want to achieve optimal performance, okay? Um, data types, really big deal. So this is on the data architecture side of things. I'm going to go kind of fast on these um, just because I've talked about it a little bit already, but, you know, comparing integer and big integer to a GUID or um, or a sequential GUID, which is a newer variation that actually does put them in order so that you can uh, more effectively do things like scans on databases. They have some, uh, those two variations have some problems. Um, for example, those bad page splits that I told you about that cause lots of uh, fragmentation and um, the fact that they're very, they're fat, they're big. And so they take a lot of uh, space up. The other thing too, I, I do want to point out, having worked with databases since 86, is that, uh, you know, an integer or a big integer, when you look at this column here and you look at an example, order ID, let's say it's 4,400,042. Well, that's a number I can keep in my head if I have to do troubleshooting of an application or some code. But look at the value of this GUID here, right? It's a hexadecimal string, H20, I'm sorry, HC0C06E1. You know, and that's the first of many 
kind of strings in that. I can't keep that in my head. So GUID versus INT for me also comes down to how easy is it to work with as a human being and GUIDs ain't it. Um, so that's another reason why I prefer to stick with uh, INTs in a case like that. Now, there are, again, we could spend half a day or a day just talking about how important data type choices are when you're designing a new database or when you're designing an application. Um, so here's just a, a couple quick caveats. Um, for example, when you choose data types kind of uh, haphazardly. So maybe I've seen people will use uh, a numeric or string data type for date or date and time or those kind of things. Uh, maybe an integer data type and they'll say, well, that represents the, the number of tick marks since a particular starting point. Uh, you know what happens in a situation like that? 12 years from now, somebody has to maintain this system and they're looking at your data type choices and they have no idea what any of it means because the documentation either hasn't survived or we never wrote it in the first place. So, um, you know, just don't just don't go down that path. Um, and there's some other remarks there as well, like using SQL variant for anything, just don't. That's an old fashioned, a uh, timestamp is another old fashioned uh, method for tracking certain very specific uh, data situations. And I really think there are better ways to do that now. Um, there are also big space wasters. And, you know, I mentioned how we want to fit as much on those 8K data pages as we can. So if you use date time or date time two, when all we really need is date and we're not even tracking time in this application, we have no use for time in this, you're consuming a lot of additional space on each of those uh, rows where you have that data type defined. Um, using character, when variable character is fine. Using in varchar or in char, when the varchar or char are okay. Remember with the anything that preceded by an N, that means it uses the uh, Unicode encoding um, method, which is four bits per digit in a string. Whereas let's say if you had char, it's only two. Now, the standard encoding is only two bits per digit in that string. So you basically doubled at a binary level how much data has to be stored for that, okay? Um, in varchar, in char columns that don't need you to code, again, that kills your performance. Um, if a column shouldn't be nullable, I still see lots of folks using, um, you know, leaving those columns as nullable when they shouldn't be. And, and not only does it present some logical issues, it also, also can slow things, um, th slow things down a little bit. And then I also see lots of people using um, like a generic text column to store CSV data or XML data or JSON data. And then they have to write all these functions and so forth to shred that data as they need to retrieve it. And um, that's a big, big performance impediment. And here's a big deal too. Let's say you have defined a particular column in a, uh, in a table as a in varchar 50. But in the stored procedures, the developers didn't pay a lot of attention to that. And so they declared their parameters that address that table in the stored procedure as varchar, not in varchar, but varchar. That will cause a very particular kind of problem called an implicit conversion, okay? And this is a horrible performance killer, okay? Um, and there's a lot of data types in SQL Server that seem like they should be perfectly compatible, but in fact, they are not. So for example, it, uh, here I've got the, um, you know, let's say in the table, it's money and decimal and float. But for some reason, um, it was a precision of, you know, n comma zero, meaning there's no digits after the decimal place. And so the developer writes their stored procedure and, and just defines it as, as an int. SQL Server will see that and say, oh, these aren't compatible data types, but I think I know what you mean. So I'll go ahead and process this query for you and, and do behind the scenes, a conversion function for you implicitly, right? It's not explicitly asked for by you. SQL Server implicitly guesses that you want it. Now the query works great, 
in the sense of it returns the data and doesn't throw an error, but the performance hit is massive, okay? And uh, this can happen anytime you have two data types that are not naturally compatible with each other. So let's say you have um, one table that has um, category ID is an integer, and then another table category ID is char five. Um, and you do a join on those two category IDs. Again, it'll cause an implicit conversion. Depending on your version of SQL Server, this can be a really, really big hit to both CPU and to just processing time in general, okay? If you want, I'll show you an example in a moment when we do some demos, but uh, keep this in mind. And there's also some references here in case you wanna study this some more. Uh, just go to sqlperformance.com and type in implicit conversion in the search there and you'll find a lot of articles about this. Another very important issue uh, in terms of code uh, application architecture is when you use a function call on an indexed field. And it can be a user defined function that you've written in T-SQL yourself, or it can be a system function. Um, you know, something like uh, an isno as I've shown here, but other things as well. And in those cases, what happens is SQL Server can't really use the index there. And so uh, it may be able to get some general help from the index and do an index scan instead of a full table scan, but that's as good as it's gonna get. It can't do a seek, which is very fast, remember, and goes just to the pages we need rather than looking through all the pages in the table. So that's another issue that comes into play with implicit conversion because behind the scenes, it's implying a conversion function on that column when the data types differ too much. Uh, a couple charts that you'll wanna take advantage of. Um, so I have the links here for you. So there is actually some, um, prescripted guidance for you from Microsoft about what you should avoid in a situation like that, okay? So let's switch over and I wanna show you a few examples of some of these red flags that we see when we're looking at implicit conversions and, and those kind of things, right? So let's say we have a table in the AdventureWorks database and different people are writing their queries against that uh, table in different ways. So let me turn on execution plans here. And by the way, if you are using old versions of SQL Server Management Studio, hopefully this will um, uh, give you enough encouragement to upgrade to the latest version of SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, around SQL Server 2014, or maybe it was 2016, um, they, they split apart management studio from SQL Server itself. And so they were able to, to rev it more often, put new features in it, and yet make it backward compatible all the way to SQL Server 2005. So you get new features if you're running on uh, management studio 2019, like I am here, compared to SQL Server 2014. Even if it's the same SQL Server 2014 database, you get new features by using the latest version of Management Studio. So let me show you. Um, we have a table, humanresources.employee, and all the columns in there are defined by specific data type. And when we query um, a column and we don't put quotes on it, but it's a numeric string, we don't put quotes on it, SQL Server says, aha, that's an integer. If we put quotes on it, SQL Server says, aha, that's a character or a string data type. And then if we proceed it with an N and then the quote mark, SQL Server says, aha, that's Unicode. So let's go ahead and execute these three. We're turning on our execution plan, ex um, the actual execution plans. And so they all three work. They're simple queries, but notice here, that we actually hit, have an exclamation point on this first execution plan. And it tells us, hey, complicit, convert implicit on this column. Um, and so it's gonna affect performance here. Whereas if we look at the next couple, we see that they're not provoking that sort of problem, okay? And so we get a performance improvement when we are using the right data type in both the query and in the table. 
that also applies in your um, in your designs and so forth. So let's say, for example, um, I'm going to create a table called product category. It has category ID as an integer. It has category name as varchar50. Okay, now I'm going to create a product table, but I created this one, uh, the, uh, the product category last Friday, and I was already uh, hitting the sauce a little bit before to the end of the day. So I've for forgotten completely about it. When I come in on Monday morning, I start to create my product table and notice the category ID here is varchar10, not integer. SQL Server says, great, I'll create that for you. Now we insert some values in each of those tables. And I wanna give a hat tip to my friend, uh, Jess Borland, who made this example. So we've entered all that data into those two tables. And now if we come along and um, do a couple queries, and in this case, I'm just gonna do it in the from clause, but it could be in the where clause or join clause anywhere in that code execute the code, they work, not a problem, but let's look at those execution plans again. Notice that I've got a warning here. The difference is that the implicit conversion switches from uh, one table to the other, depending on which of these queries we're looking at. So um, here it's on the second uh, branch of the, of the join, and then down here, it's going to be on the first branch of the join. Okay, so this is a big problem. One of the cool things, though, let me do my cleanup here, is that the um, one of the cool things, though, is that we can, if we're running a, a recent version of SQL Server, we can actually take a look at the the plan cache and see if any tables exist out there that have implicit, or I'm sorry, any queries out there, stored procedures, triggers, views that have implicit conversion. So let's see here. I'll go to VentureWorks. Again, this is written by my friend, Jonathan Cahayas, and he's blogged ex extensively about this kind of stuff. This is not harmful to run in production. Um, and it uh, it only um, only thing to worry about is that if you have a really big cache, you know, you have a half a terabyte of RAM, it's going to run for a while. But here you can see if there are any queries live in the plan cache, it will come back and tell you what they are, what the um, uh, schema and the database and the table is, what the data type is. So that's pretty cool. You can find them if you have a long time uh, piece of application code that's been running forever. You can see where they, they occur. Uh, another kind of example query that I have in here, written by a consultant named Ian Sturk, who lives uh, over in the UK, is uh, this simple query will actually just go through and look at your database and tell you if there are any uh, significant mismatches between two tables. So in this case, well, let me see. I'm going to have to look around here. Uh, TPCH doesn't have any. And where this can be useful, um, most useful, is when you're doing a, um, a look at some, maybe some code provided by a vendor, for example. It's not uncommon for them to, to have these kind of marketing literature that says our app runs equally well on Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and PostgreSQL. And beware anytime you see that, because what it really means is their application runs equally craptacular on every one of those database platforms. They're not going to take the time to performance tune those. They just get it to do a functional test, and once it passes, they're done. So um, here in the AdventureWorks database, it's telling me that we have a, a variety of different tables. Um, I'm sorry, columns in tables. And overall, the data types are uh, maybe a little bit different, but they're not so different that they're going to cause implicit conversions. So this is good. Now I have a kind of a uh, warm and fuzzy feeling that this database isn't too bad. 
by the way, um, don't tell anyone I told you this, but if you were to point these at some of the, you know, the popular Microsoft written apps like SharePoint or um, Great Plains or Exapta or those kinds of products, the SQL Server databases are just full of issues um, and kind of not best practices sorts of stuff, right? So, um, all right. So let me show you uh, some more and, and we'll go to do some more demos. And we'll only be another 15 minutes tops, okay? So one thing is uh, a lot of people uh, when designing an app or designing a database that accompanies an app they're writing, um, you'll find that they will pay, play fast and loose with um, whether they go through all the trouble of declaring all the foreign keys that are needed and even then uh, whether they actually put a non-clustered index on every foreign key. So you should do both, okay? When you have a foreign key, it can definitely help performance. And um, if you know a particular column in a table is frequently gonna be used as a uh, you know, foreign key in other tables, then absolutely do that. Um, also, beware of ORMs. Okay, so many ORMs like to create tables by default with a clustered key that is a GUID, and they um, have lots of problems with joins. And uh, so they don't necessarily automatically put in those foreign keys or clustered key constraints, um, unique key constraints. And so that's something to, to keep in mind. So let me show you a little bit about this situation in a demo here, okay? So we, uh, let's see here, we've got a database called Corp DB. And one of the things that um, SQL Server can do is if you have um, uh, an ex, uh, you have a query and you want to do a query against some set of values where you have, let's say a default constraint, or maybe you have a, um, a check constraint that says the value in this column can be between 10 and 300, okay? So in a situation like this, um, let's take a look at the, ex, uh, um, the estimated execution plan. So notice what it says here is we have to do a full table scan. Now, if I was to run this though, it would actually not even return any results. And the reason for that is a feature of constraints called contradiction detection. So if you've told SQL Server a value has to be between uh, 30 and 40, and the query says, I want to find everything with a unit price greater than 50 or less than 25, well, that contradicts the constraint. And SQL Server says, you know what? I'm not even gonna process that query because I will never have a row in the database that satisfies this query. And so it saves us a lot of time by not working on those kinds of queries, okay? Another example is um, if we have a table where there's a foreign key, it can really help SQL Server process the data effectively, okay? Uh, and so in this case, I'm just gonna ask for order ID, order date, and customer ID. I'm gonna get that estimated execution plan here. And so we see that we have um, a simple clustered index scan and the retrieval of the data and the, the, the step for um, bring the data back to us. Now, if I disable the primary key or the foreign key, I can um, I can still access this, but notice when I get the um, I probably should have shouldn't have there we go now notice when I get the execution plan it actually has to go and look at both tables again look at the query that we've got here it is order header order ID order header order date and order header customer ID. So when we have that foreign key, 
that says, make sure the data exists in the second table, the customer table, it knows that I don't even have to look at the second table actually, because the foreign key has ensured the referential integrity between the two. But when I dropped that um, foreign key, now it says, oh man, now I've got to do all this extra work and grab data from both of these tables, use a nested loop join to iterate through all these values to verify that it is in fact there. So having a foreign key saves you time. A lot of people are really surprised when they see this and it's, it's a little bit uh, unexpected for them. Um, there's some more to the demo, but uh, I'm gonna skip that for now. But having that key in place makes things faster. Now, let me show you a, a couple other red flags that are kind of interesting too. Um, and this has to do with how the query optimizer works on SQL Server. So let's flip back and look at the slides just for a minute, and then we'll come back and look at a couple more demos. So the first thing I wanna make sure that everybody understands is that the query optimizer is an amazingly beautiful thing, okay? Um, in fact, I'm kind of surprised we get the kind of answers from SQL Server as fast as we do, uh, given the garbage designs that so many of us uh, raises his hand, you know, the first 10 years of my career uh, wrote. Um, so how does it do it? Well, SQL Server doesn't actually look for the very best plan. It looks for an optimal plan. And the, um, the difference of the two comes down to, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the best plan versus the optimal plan. The difference in the two is time. Because in order to find the very best plan, I have to look at every option. Whereas in order to find an optimal plan, I just need to get it done in a reason, find a good enough plan in a reasonable amount of time. So let me ex explain a little bit more detail why a best plan isn't necessarily time efficient. Assume I've got a query that's gonna look at four tables, table A, B, C, D, right? Each of those tables has a clustered index and three non-clustered indexes, okay? That's not a crazy uh, set of tables to look at. And so our query would say something like, select all these columns from table A, uh, join on the key to table B, join on the key to table C, and then to table D, right? Not rocket science in terms of how SQL Server is gonna process this. However, the math gets complicated really fast because SQL Server has the option of using multiple physical access methods to get to that data. So it could do an unordered clustered index scan. It could do a covering index scan. It could do an ordered clustered index scan, or it could use any of the non-clustered indexes. So it could do a seek, uh, it could do a non-clustered uh, scan, it could, you know, all kinds of that, those physical access methods add up to 72 different options per table, okay? And then on top of that, SQL Server does a transformation um, it's called the associative transformation in which it reorders all of the tables in their joins. So let's say for example, table D only had a few hundred records in it and the others had hundreds of thousands or millions of records. Now table D comes at the very end of the joins there, but it helps eliminate hundreds of thousands of records early in the query optimization process. And so SQL Server could have a much smaller memory grant if we filtered based on D, table D first, rather than going an ordinal position of A, B, C, and then D. So SQL Server will actually go through and try all 24 possible ordering of the join statements. And so it might choose this very last one, D, join to C, join to B, join to A, as the right one, the optimal one, because it eliminates more rows from the processing very early in the process and keeps us from having to worry about and carry all that water, to use the analogy from the, um, the well earlier, okay? And then on top of that, there's some other factors that come into play, like SQL Server has three different join algorithms. It has a nested loop, a join, and a merge, I'm sorry, hash and a merge. So when you look at all of those different permutations, for four tables with a clustered index and three non-clustered indexes, we're talking about 26,000 possibilities 
that the optimizer might have to look at, okay? So SQL Server doesn't actually do that. What it does is it uses this approach, right? To find the difference in, uh, in the time and energy needed to process strategy A or, or query plan A versus query plan B is huge. So it's much better for us to just take one, either one of those, A or B, because the difference is in nanoseconds between the two. So let's just do that, okay? Um, I will show you in a few minutes that there is a way you can take SQL, uh, tell SQL Server to give the optimizer a little bit more time. So uh, there were times in my past where we had um, very, very heavily utilized stored procedures that were called 40, 50,000 times a day. So I wanted to make sure that the execution plan was as good as it could be because in aggregate over the course of a single day, it would save us bazillions of CPU cycles. And that's the official number that we used, uh, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of CPU cycles in a given day, because it was so much, um, it used so much uh, resources and it was called so often. Um, so in fact, let me go ahead and show you some of these, um, some of these examples, okay? And again, this isn't really a, um, a query tuning session, but I, I'll just do some things to, uh, to give you some, some basic ideas and show you some basic shapes of execution plans. So make sure I'm in my right database. And so now I've got uh, a column I want to query from a table. It's in the sales uh, schema of the sales order header table. And I want to find all the records that have a salesperson ID of 283. Okay. And I'll turn on my execution plans here, my actual execution plans. And sure enough, I get my results set. The question is, was SQL Server able to use that search argument to perform an index seek rather than a scan? So when we look at the execution plan, Lo and behold, there it is. It has one simple step that it performs, uses that index seek as the search argument, and then it returns for us 189 rows, very fast. Now, um, remember when I was telling you earlier that sometimes if you put a function call, like um, in my stored procedure, uh, what I should have done is declared the variable for the salesperson ID and said, if it's null, make it zero. So that here, it wouldn't um, actually require me to put a function call on this column. But let's see what happens if I say, if nobody passed in a value, um, I'm sorry, if there is no value, it's null in that field, then I want you to treat it as if it's zero instead. So again, we get our results set. We look at the execution plan, but look here. Instead of index seek, it says index scan. So now it had to read a whole bunch of additional of those 8K data pages to return the same 189 records in the results set, okay? So it makes our life difficult. Now here's a really interesting thing that a lot of people don't know. Even very, very experienced query tuners. Relational databases are based on a, a couple academic kind of heady sets of theories. One is relational algebra. Uh, another is called set theory, which itself is derived from something called relational calculus. And one of the things that's really interesting about uh, set theory is that all relational databases have this issue, by the way. Oracle, MySQL, DB2, you know, any of them. They're great at finding a set of data. But what happens when you ask for not a set of data? Okay. So find every sales order ID where the salesperson is not number 283. Okay. Let's take a look at that and see what happens. Now, if it was just a simple inversion of what we had done before, we're going to see a two-step execution plan. But what do we got? Whoa. Look at that. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven steps in this execution plan. Okay. Much more complicated. And the reason for that is anytime you ask a relational database to find not 
a set in its search argument space, it actually has to find all of the sets first and examine them and throw them away. And then it comes down to those that aren't in your set, okay? This is something that a smart SQL coder will actually do something about. So here, I have changed the where clause to say where it's greater than 283 or less than 283, which will give me the exact same result set as saying not equal to 283. But look what happens here. Okay, there's our records, same as before. Is it gonna be a big complex execution plan? Nope, because we asked SQL Server to find two sets from the same set of search arguments. So it's back to being very simple and very easy and surprising. But uh, you see all these um, store procedures and things that ask for not this and not that or not, not equal to this and not equal to that. And it slows down their performance. This even applies to things like uh, subqueries. So here, let's look at a subquery. We say, this is a normal subquery, find me the set where the business entity ID from the person table uh, is from anybody who's named David Campbell, right? So we execute this and we look at that execution plan and we see that basically it has two index seeks, one against the person table and one against the sales order header table. But what if we say where it's not in everybody who's not equal to David Campbell? And we execute that one, comes back pretty fast. But again, behind the scenes, hey, look at this. We see all kinds of issues with this massive execution plan. And on top, there's a warning here. It says, hey, this actually uh, required an excessive memory grant. Um, so keep that in mind. It's going to cause some problems there. Right? So a lot of people don't realize that this is, uh, is a pretty big deal. Okay. All right. Now, we're in the final couple of minutes here. Some issues about data quality. Uh, and um, I'm actually gonna skip this um, here. And I wanna go over to my demo again. And now what I wanna do here is to show you a, a script that I built out that actually finds um, a lot uh, I shouldn't say I built this script. I also pilfered a lot of uh, scripts from bloggers who help find uh, these particular problems in uh, in their blog posts and stuff. So I've tried to give credit where I uh, remembered to back in the, um, but I didn't keep real close track of this when it first started. So when I first started building this. So here, for example, is I'm looking for, um, tell me about all of the tables in a, in a given um, database. And I want to make sure that they have similar naming structures, right? I don't wanna uh, take a look at these and find out that some of them are plurals, some of them are singulars, um, you know, that they're very inconsistent. As I say here, one of them says, for example, get customer details, but then the next stored procedure that does something similar says customer update. And it's like, well, what is it? Is it verb first or is it verb last? Um, so I wanna look, especially when I'm buying products from other companies, I want to do this review, or maybe you have a dev team and you want to do a code review as a DBA. This is very, very useful for that kind of situation. So now another thing I want to look at is SQL Server has no restriction from creating um, tables that far exceed the size of um, an 8K data page uh, and also of the amount of space that are actually consumed by the values in those columns. So maybe you have a, a bunch of columns in a particular data um, database uh, and table in that database that are 180, curse, um, 180 characters long, but the biggest value currently in there is 40. Why would you make it you know, four times as big as you need? Um, so why not go back and change that data type so it saves you some space, okay? So this particular uh, query will find if you have any of those kind of oversized um, tables, uh, the columns are, are not the right size and so forth. And while that's processing, I'll tell you about a little bit more uh, that we have here. Um, so again, trying to give credit to the 
the various authors. Um, David Maury was um, an Italian Microsoft MVP, a colleague uh, in the MVP co uh, co um, cohort, and he now works for Microsoft, but he's done some great uh, coding here. For example, this looks at your different indexes or your different tables, and it tells you if it has the right kind of indexes. If you have, um, for every column that um, is a search argument, whether it has a foreign key or not, whether it has a non-clustered index or not, whether it has a clustered index and a primary key. So it gives you all that information. Here we've got a, all right, the query finally returned and we have one column that's oversized. Okay, um, a simple query that tells us if our tables do not have um, primary keys. Here's tables without foreign keys or tables that have a declared foreign key, but they don't have an index, a non-clustered index on them. So again, this can uh, tell us if that's the case. None in this particular table. We can find out if any um, missing index warnings have gone off. Another one that's very important, don't have duplicate indexes, multiple indexes that are on the same, um, on the same column. Right, so I don't think we're going to find anything here, but I'll go ahead and execute it uh, just in case. Oh, we actually do have one. Okay, so the um, table warehouse has W details, and uh, so it's a duplicate there. Yeah. Good to know. I'm going to skip along, move along a little bit faster here. Um, here is a query. This is actually one that I've written that tells you using perfmon counters collected and queried inside of SQL Server about problematic situations. For example, uh, if you have any deadlocks, if you have forwarded records per second, those only occur, that's a problem, and they only occur, forwarded records only occur on heaps. So this uh, tells me a, a variety of different indicators of if there might be any issues here on my SQL Server according to the different um, Perfmon counters here. All right, uh, this is uh, a query to show us different activity on our databases and the um, the different indexed columns and so forth. So we can tell if we have key lookups uh, and full table scans. So these are also problematic situations that happen. Now the code library that I have is much, much bigger. It's actually four times bigger than when I demoed, but we don't have time for that. Um, and let's see here, since I'm, I'm running a little over, I'll go ahead and skip to the wrap up. One thing else though, I did want to show you just kind of quickly is I mentioned how there is a command, um, not really a command, but there's something you can use in SQL Server that says give this particular SQL statement more time to process on the optimizer. And that is trace flag 8780, okay? It basically adds up to give SQL Server more time, okay? So this is what the query looks like. Uh, in my experimentation, it doesn't help at all on queries that have less than a four tables joined together. Really, you'd only use it in really extreme, ugly, poorly written queries. So in this example, I'm using Plan Explorer now instead of Management Studio. And notice that it's highlighting some of the red flags here. So the first red flag that I see is that the estimated rows and the actual rows are very, very different. Um, you know, thousands of percent different. What that tells me is that the indexes of the tables that I'm querying are really stale and those indexes need to be rebuilt or refreshed, okay? That's, that's one issue. It also tells us that I have a sort operation. That means uh, a intermediate result set is gonna be sorted in tempdb, and that's a very slow operation. Also notice we have a key lookup. Um, again, those are problematic. We have no row ID lookups, but we do have three clustered index scans. That means it's a full table scan, right? Um, if you look down at the execution plan down below, you'll see that um, <clears throat> the more intense the color, the more problematic that particular operator is in the execution plan. So here is one of our clustered index scans. Uh, 
But then over here, we have some of these are even showing up in red. So things like um, the sort operation right, uh, right here after the nested loops, okay? So check this out. Uh, Plan Explorer keeps track of your execution plan uh, for a given SQL statement as you change it over time. So the first time I wrote the query was just to get the the um, the where clause hammered out, not the all the joins and I'm sorry, all the columns uh, figured out. So if we look at this one, we see okay, it's a very different execution plan. All right. That's the first thing we see. Now uh, I've got a where clause on the cardinality type. Oh, look at that. It's now again, a very different execution plan. Um, so we added another where clause on the person type and very different execution plan again. And then we added uh, the sales order number and the sales order, uh, the country region type. Um, let me resize this a little bit. You can't really do this resizing in Management Studio as well. Um, so this is kind of the final form of the query as I wrote it. Um, and notice that we have a couple of warning signs midway. This is telling us about really expensive, really problematic situations. And so this is a spill to TempDB that is massive. It's 91 megabytes in size. And looks like it is 33 point something megabytes, uh, you know, zillions of rows. So it points out to us specific things that are happening that we can maybe code around to make those go away. And also down at the bottom, you'll see here, these are the weight stats that accumulate for all these different operations as the query execute. Cutes. And then we have the perfmon indicators for the amount of IOs consumed and CPU consumed. And so we can actually go over here and without even touching the server again, we can replay how this query is processed by SQL Server. And you can see it moving along down here across the graph and up above uh, blanked out there. You can see what we call the marching ants. You know, here it's gotten to the cluster index scan and now it's doing the hash join uh, followed by the sort operation and it's spending a ton of time on that sort operation working and working and working before it finally begins to, to execute the other steps. Now when I added that trace flag, 8780, notice right here it keeps track of all these different iterations that I've performed and this version with that trace flag added is about 18% faster, almost 20% faster. So again, when I click on this one, notice that it's quite a different execution plan. And notice that the weight stats are entirely different because the color of the weight stat indicates, indicates what kind of weight stat this is. So pretty much these are all um, SOS scheduler yield weight stats, which has to do with the CPU and a little bit to do with how it's handling thread processing as opposed to um, IO processing, which is what was most costly with the other version that didn't have a trace flag on it. So again, I can click that button. I can see it start to return the data and process the different execution operators as it goes along. And I can see where uh, it is on the graph for performance. It gives me very, very detailed information about how this uh, works in the internals of the SQL Server Query Optimizer. So if you ever write code a lot for SQL Server and you have to tune it and you have to make it perform well, this product is completely free and I've showed you about one-tenth of the features in the product. All right, so uh, I've covered a bunch of different uh, aspects of architectural choices that can have a really big impact on performance. And there's tiny things. There are things that you don't really think about as being a big deal, like making sure that every data type that references first name or last name is always the same in every table and in every stored procedure. If it's not, you might get implicit conversions, right? Um, issues around how you define your clustered key, whether it's an integer or whether it's a GUID or different things like that. 
also talked about data compression. Now that's just free extra performance if you're able to install that, uh, set that up and have it run. And there's um, a whole series of blog posts about how we researched that and figured out what the exceptions to that rule were, because there are some situations where it does not perform as well as we had hoped, but they're very rare. Okay, so with that, uh, again, here is my contact information. And um, I guess we'll, uh, it, it, the contact information is there in case you have any further questions, but uh, I'll open the floor now to um, any live questions if, if y'all have any. Mark, um, have you seen any questions come up perhaps in chat or something like that? Oh, so, uh, hi, Hilda Alvarez. She says, how can we get those scripts? Um, so I believe that they are posted. I, I have a little shortcut uh, on the Century One website. So if you go to centuryone.com slash kcline, they should be um, be there, but uh, that has the list of sessions you can choose from has changed recently. So if you uh, want to go to century1.com slash webinars, there's a full recording of the webinar there, slides and scripts. And if you also want to email me, of course, I'll, I'll mail those to you. What else? See a couple people saying it was a good session. So thank you very much. Namaste. I appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any additional questions in chat. Well, folks, uh, uh, Mark, um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I, I hope I didn't bore you too, too badly. And um, I see that Olga says, what, what to do instead of is null, the value, comma, zero? Um, so take just a moment, answer this question before we, um, before we wrap up. Um, it depends, right? That's the correct answer to every technology question ever. Um, it depends a little bit on if you're writing this just as a select statement that's ad hoc, or if it's embedded in a stored procedure. If it's embedded in the stored procedure or any kind of, you know, T-SQL code that can have variables like a user-defined function or a trigger, um, you have a lot of options on how you do it. So you might declare your variables at the top and up there you say if the um, end user doesn't provide a value, then make that value zero so that you never have to do is null uh, comparison, right? Um, so that's one way to do it. Another thing that we see people do is in select statements, they move any function kinds of calls off of the indexed column, right? So here we said, where is no salesperson ID comma zero equals 283? What if on the other hand, we could change that around so that um, if um, the value in the table is null, then we somehow shift that over to the other side. So we could say where uh, salesperson ID is null and, or I'm sorry, or salesperson ID is equal to 283. So you could do something like that. You could make a concaten, uh, I'm sorry, a, a parenthetical concatenated set of um, search conditions so that you don't have to use the is null function to you know, to alter that value like that. Uh, that's a great question. And in fact, there is a pretty detailed article examining all of your alternatives to that on sqlperformance.com. So really good question, Olga. 